Okay, Phil, everybody is in. All right, well, welcome everyone to the 2023 District 4 Softball Managers and Coaches Meeting for TOC and All-Stars. We ask that you please uh, keep yourself on mute for the meeting. Any questions can be asked anytime. Please type in your question and send them to the chat. There will be four question breaks during this meeting when those questions will be addressed. Tonight's meeting is uh, we're going to aim to be aimed at doing TOC and all-star softball managers and coaches, provide guidance for all the TOC and all-star requirements, provide guidance for expected behaviors and actions throughout the tournament, list and explain TOC and all-star playing rules and regulations, and answer any questions related to that or concerns. Tonight, uh, we will, I'll introduce the District 4 staff, what exactly TOCs and All-Stars are, um, pre-tournament preparation and paperwork, game day preparation, where to find tournament schedules and information, when to arrive at the fields, all the free game information, uh, TOC All-Star rules, then after game, what you need to do, and then we'll do a quick review at the end. Unless, unless otherwise stated, all the slides apply to both TOC and All-Stars. This emblem basically designates what is TOC, what is All-Stars. This is uh, Little League California District 4 is under the jurisdiction of District Administrator Ted Boett. He also serves as the tournament director for both tournaments. Aiding to the district administrator in administering these tournaments are the assistant directors for District 4. Jeff Du is the ADA for Little League Baseball. Don Waddell is the district chief umpire. Carla Moore is our district secretary. Liz Berg is the district safety officer. Grayson Lawrence is the ADA for Teenage Baseball. Steve Mohammed is the ADA for Challenger. Paul Rosky is in charge of the Western Region Senior Baseball Tournament. Jim Rose is the District Training Coordinator and Assistant for the UIC for Softball. And Candido is the Assistant UIC for Baseball. Yeah, that's me. Let's go on to the next one. Okay, what are TOC and All-Stars? So TOC is a tournament of champions and are played under the Little League Special Game Regulation 9. These games are under the sole authority of California District 4, District Administrator Ted Boet. The policies for TOC are the policies of District 4. This is a special tournament designed to reward those teams that have placed first in their local league division. TOC is a single elimination tournament. The game rules are those covered in the official rules and regulations for softball. The District 4 interleague rules for softball divisions apply and supplement the official rules and regulations. No local playing rules apply, and local field ground rules do apply and must be reviewed at the plate meeting before the game. The TOC divisions are AAA. Little League Majors and Senior Leagues. <laughs> what are All-Stars? So All-Stars is the International All-Star Tournament. 
is administered by the International Tournament Director at Little League Baseball and Softball International Headquarters in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. The All-Stars are played under the regular playing rules and regulations except where modified by tournament rules and guidelines. All-Stars is a double elimination tournament. No local or interleague rules are allowed in the All-Star Tournament. Ground rules for fields do apply and must be reviewed in the plate meeting. All-Stars are a series of separate tournaments for both baseball and softball. The softball tournaments include eight to 10 year old division, nine to 11 year old division, Little League softball, which is 10 to 12 year olds, Junior League and Senior League. The TOC All Star, TOC and All Star binders. So TOC and All Star binders need to be brought to each game by team. Without certain forms, teams do not enter field or play. When teams arrive, tournament director will take possession of binders and hold in score booth until after the game. After the game is over, pitching records must be filled out in ink and signed or initialized before being handed back to the head coach. Okay, the following forms needed in the binder are all found using the Little League Forms link on the District 4 website. So you just click Little League Forms, and it'll take you to this page right here. Basically, all the forms in green are required for TOC, but you see there it says TOC uh, softball pitching record there to the left arrow, and then uh, also the uh, president's letter for TOC and All-Stars. Forms in red are required for All-Stars, green for TOC. So these are all helpful resources. District four, how to construct your tournament binder. Um, that'll tell you basically uh, what you need to put in your binder before you show up to your first game. Copy of tonight's All-Star and TOC softball presentation, which you can go there and refer back to to get any notes you may need. TOC binder. So each TOC team binder will contain the following required documents. A team roster with the manager and coach's name and signed by the league president. Pitching record to be filled out and signed and initialed after each game. President's affirmation page signed by the league president. President's aff affirmation page medical release signed by the league president and parent code of conduct signed by parent guardian for each player. Highly recommended but not required, parent signed blue ink medical release form for each player, which is basically the form probably you use during the season. If you don't have one that's in blue ink, then get one taken care of, but I would suggest you carry them with you at all times. Um, also, a photocopy of a valid California identification for manager and coaches in binder, but just a copy of it will be fine. And this just uh, make sure that uh, we have the right people coaching in the uh, that's a gut for what the paperwork says in the binder. Uh, a valid California identification on person will be required, but one of one or the other is required to be able to enter the field. So if you don't have that information up there you will not be allowed to enter the field to start preparing for your game. The team roster is required in the binder. Team roster, <clears throat> teams are not allowed to play without a team roster. Team roster needs league president signature. And that's one of those forms that's on that district four website for team roster. And it basically just lists all the information for your team with the signature of the uh, president down below confirming it. Verifies the players, lists both managers, and no substitutes for player, coaches, or managers. So once the roster is set, you cannot make any changes in your roster after the first game. 
And there it is right there, the uh, TOC softball roster. You can download that and print it and fill it out. And there it is right there. All the information you need. If you're wondering about league ID, league number, that's something your uh, president should know. Uh, he'll, he can let you know what that is or fill it in himself. Your league name, division, team name, sponsor if you want. Um, and then all the information there. And then the signature of your president. And there you go. The pitching record is also required in the binder and brought to each game. It's signed by the TD and initialed by manager after each game. The form records each pitcher's total. No, that's not true. There's no total pitches. It's going to be inning. Um, Jim, you there? Yeah, that, that's a wrong slide. It, it yeah, that's uh, it's just the innings pitched. Right. It's just the innings pitched. That's for, I think that's for baseball. <clears throat> and there's the pitching record you can print and put in your binder as well. Uh, there you go. So basically, uh, the name of the team there at the top, the name of the player, the date, the number of innings they pitched, and then the tournament director will sign there. And then uh, whoever the coach is, if you want to initialize it or um, whatever works for you, just to confirm that you have agreed to it and there's no question when you go to another field to play a game. Pitching record. So after the game, take the time to make sure the pitching record is complete and correct. There you go, before initializing it. Um, sometimes you get wrapped up dealing with picking up your equipment, getting everything situated. Just take a quick look and make sure it matches up because there's nothing worse than showing up to your next game after you've left the field and something doesn't match up for what you thought it was. So that's very important you take care of as soon as your game's over. And there is the president's affirmation pages down there at the bottom right. And that's just the president basically saying that, oh, here we go. Signed by the league president required in binders. Four required trainings for managers and coaches have been completed. That's one of the pages the president will sign. Manager and coaches have signed and acknowledged the youth sports concussion protocols and certifies all parents have been provided and signed the heads up concussion information sheet and managers and coaches have been informed about the district four and Northern California dress code that will be enforced. So basically that's all information your president is signing off, assuming that, uh, or recalling you that that's what's required. And there's the president's information page which he will sign, stating that you took care of all that stuff. Um, and then the, also the, <clears throat> President's uh, information page, medical release. Basically, if you don't have your medical releases and you have this page, that will pass. But I still recommend you carry the uh, medical releases with you. And this is the form for that. Um, the medical releases that uh, the president's affirmation page medical release attests that medical release form for each player at each game is the best practice and highly recommended. If included, it should have an original parent signature in blue ink. And there is the form for the medical release form if you don't already have one. Pretty cut and dry there. All star binder. So this is a little more detailed. Um, the All-Star Binder will, will contain the following required documents. So there is an eight-page All-Star Affidavit and Boundary Map with required signatures. Um, if you're a new coach looking at all this and don't get, you know, like, what, what is all this stuff? Um, there should be somebody in your league that's hopefully taking care of binders or at least can help you guide you through. Um, there is information on the district board website to help you put together those books. And of course, if you have any questions, you can call me uh, and I can help you or direct you to the people that can answer the questions you may need. Um, 
There are more documents confirming parents' residency or school enrollment form appro appropriately signed for each player. So basically, three or more documents confirming residency or the school enrollment form. I would suggest the school enrollment form. It's a lot easier to deal with other than trying to get three different documents of residency and making sure they're dated properly in the whole deal. Um, you need that for each player playing all stars. The tournament verification form for each player and verification of a valid birth certificate. A birth certificate or copy is a birth certificate or copy is not required in the binder. The affidavit stamped by district four for each player confirming age verifies age. So basically, when you turn your binders in for your new players, the uh, birth certificate and stuff will be checked at that point. And then once the coach gets the book back, make sure uh, you give the birth certificates back to the players because they're going to want them just for their uh, peace of mind. All-Star Team Binder will contain the following required documents. So uh, All-Star President's affirmation page signed by the league president the uh, affirmation medical release signed, and the parents go to contact signed. Uh, once again, the same thing as TOC, it's highly recommended to carry all those medical release forms with you. Once again, there might be information on those medical release forms that you may not have on the other form that's in your binder for emergency contact people or anything like that, so it's a good idea to carry them. And the photocopy is the same as TOC, valid California identification for managers and coaches and binder. This or valid, valid California identification on person will be required. One or the other is required to be able to enter the field. All-star affidavit boundary map required in binder. The affidavit boundary map is automatically generated from the data center. And what the data center is, is something that each president knows how to get into and whoever the president has dealing with this paperwork knows how to get into. So when you type in the rosters of your all-star team in the data center, the map will automatically print out and show where each child is living, making sure they're within your boundaries for uh, all-stars. Uh, let's see, it must contain the signature of the league president and the district administ administrator to be valid. All-star affidavit required in binder. So this is a, a multi-page document, which we talked about. The eight-page uh, illustrated in the slides is an older version. Uh, page one, the league information and division. Page two is the district administrator, league president, player agent, and team manager signatures. Pages three to five in the affidavit is the regular season team manager and coach and player information. Page six is player and manager coach replacement, meaning if a player or manager cannot attend a game, this is a separate page that will be dealt with usually at the game you're going to by the tournament director. And then pages seven and eight are the pitching record that we keep track of after each game. And those are all the pages. And if you have any questions on these pages, um, if you don't know, if you haven't even heard anything about this, I would contact your league president to find out to make sure someone's on the ball and, and dealing with this. You don't want to wait to the last minute because all this stuff is due on June 17th. So you got a couple of weeks to deal with this. So don't wait to the last minute. Get it taken care of. Next page, Jim. All-star affidavit. So before team is allowed on the field, the TD will match manager and coach's name on the affidavit with the government issued photo identification. Manager and coach can photocopy all identifications on one page in the binder. Then the TD will match player information on affidavit with medical release form and player. Basically, the TD will probably go into the dugout with your team and just identify each player real quick to make sure that uh, each player in the dugout matches the paperwork in the binder just to get the right uh, roster and make sure everybody's there. 
the TD will match government photo ID, photo copy of ID inviter. Okay, this is this the info. This is the page, and this is the information of the three manager and two coaches signatures. And this is the same thing with the players. You see all the little information there. But once again, um, these forms are something that's printed off the data center. So whoever's taking care of that will be filling that in. Uh, unless you, you as a coach and your president is giving you the information to go ahead and do it yourself. But generally, it's uh, someone that's got some experience and uh, knows what they're doing. Because someone that's new to this, it might be a little overwhelming. Next. This is the pitching record that needs to get filled out after the game is over by the tournament director um, or scorekeeper and the tournament director initializing it, making sure it's correct. And then the coach of this pitching record, checking it and make sure it's, uh, he agrees with it as well. And there's the example, how, it, how, how the pitching record will be filled out for each game. And if there's, and if there's more than one pitcher you'll see two or three or four names on that list as well. And here are some more information on the, uh, these are the forms you can, for the medical re release and the manager coaches acknowledgement forms for that information page that the president will sign. Okay, so this is the, uh, basically the four required trainings in managers for coaches have been completed. Uh, this is also that they've completed the concussion protocol, certifies all parents have been provided the stock and signed the heads up concussion information sheet, and that the manager and coaches have been informed about the District 4 and Northern California dress codes that will be enforced. And once again, those pages that the president signed is all that needs to be in the binder. He, him stating that you guys have completed it is good enough for us. And there's the form right there. Affirms, okay, yeah, this is just the medical release information that we have talked about in DOC, same type of deal. And here's the form the president will sign. And there's the link for the parent code of conduct. California District 4 Parent Code of Conduct is required in the binder. Team Code of Conduct forms signed by each player's parent or guardian, or each player must have an individual parent or guardian signed Code of Conduct form in the binder. And there are the links there to uh, print that stuff out as well. And that's the form. You see each player is going to print their name on there. And then the parent or guardian of player, each one will sign it there. And there's the list on the left of everything that they're saying they're going to abide by, which is really not nothing out of the ordinary. And that's the end. That's the that's the other form. If you don't have, if you don't do the group one, this is an individual one that each parent will sign. Tournament verification form for each player required in the binder. The tournament verification form is automatically generated for each player through the data center. This must be stamped by District Four. And that's the form there. Now, once again, a lot of this stuff too. If you have players on your team that are returning to All-Stars, a lot of this stuff your president did already have. Um, a lot of this paperwork that you need, like birth certificates, those are only for new players that have never played All-Stars. Your president should have a list of every player in his league showing who played All-Stars so you don't have to double dip and get that information. The returning players, whether they're 13 and they played All-Stars when they were nine, should, the president should have that information and save you on uh, trying to get more paperwork from the parents. Proof of residency or school attendance enrollment. So a player must show residency proof or school enrollment proof. School enrollment is proven with either school enrollment record or the Little League school enrollment form. Residency is proven by three documents from three different 
Little League categories of parents' residency. These also must be stamped by District 4 for approval. And this is the school enrollment form. So this form, basically, you take to your local school that the child attended, fill in the information. They sign it saying that he did attend this school which, because this school is within your boundaries, and he's good to go. You will not need the three forms of documentation if you just do this form right here. And this is the easier way to go about if your school is still uh, open, which I know in Martinez, they stay open about two to three weeks after the last day of school. So there should be somebody in your district office that can take care of this. Um, age and residency requirement. And that's the form for that. Basically, you see three categories. If you don't do the school form, for example, if your child goes to school outside your boundary and you have to do residency, those are the three categories there to the left, and you have to have one for each category to prove that that child lives within that particular league's boundaries. Medical release forms, recommended for binder. Um, if included, it should have an original parent signature in blue ink, and once again, I can't recommend enough that you should have those in your binder. And there's the link there for the uh, medical release form. And most of you already have these for kids. Uh, well, in the TOC, you do all stars. You may need some new ones because obviously some of the kids playing all stars did not play for you this year. They played on other teams. And these are the uh, president page requirements for the TOC and all stars president's information page requirements. Required training and documents. The following training and documents must be completed by the TOC and All-Star coaching staff and parents. The league president and his or her signed affirmation page attest that these have been completed. Proof of completion of training or documents are not required for the binders. Basically, what I said earlier, all we need is that page signed by your president stating that you guys took care of it. Same thing with the concussion awareness of players. Each player and parent must review and sign and date the player concussion form, or a player and parent must sign the individual team concussion form. Each manager and coach must sign the California concussion awareness verification. These forms are not required to be in the binder. Once again, just the page showing that the president has confirmed that you guys have taken care of this as well. And those are the links to go to them and get them taken care of. I suggest just printing them off, taking them to practice, and have your parents take care of it. The team concussion awareness form, this is the same sheet I just showed you earlier for TOC. All of them can be on there at once with the parent signature, and you're good to go. Here's the individual player concussion awareness form. Only use if team form is not signed by a player and parent. Uh, and here's the one for the manager and the coaches as well. As well. Required trainings for managers and coaches. So every manager and coach must take these trainings. The signed league president's information assures these have been completed. You must take the CDC Heads Up Concussion Training Course, Safe Sport Abuse Awareness, Sudden Cardiac Arrest Awareness, and Diamond Leadership Training. I've been told these all total together somewhere around 20 to 25 minutes a piece. So get started on them now so you don't have to do them all at the last minute before you turn to take care of your paperwork. And those are the links right there to take care of, and you can go right on them and start getting at it. Okay, so Tim, do we have any questions? Yes, we do have some questions. Okay. Um, what's the rule about high schoolers playing in TOC? For which, for senior division, I'm assuming? I would assume so. Yeah. Um, Jim, you want to explain that one? Uh, 
Well, are they, if they've been on your regular season roster. Correct. And if they've played, and I don't have it off the top of my head. Well, I do know, unless the rule has changed this year, and maybe Ted can help us out, but I believe they have to play in at least 50% of the games if they're on the roster. But Senior League has changed so many rules this year, I'm not sure if 50% is still required, and maybe Ted can answer that. All right, so it would be 50% of the games they're eligible for. So if they, okay. when their high school season was complete and there was two games still in the season, they'd have to play one. If there were no games left and they were on the roster, they wouldn't have to play any. The only thing that they would have to do is, again, go to the Little League form page. There's a separate page to fill out that shows that they played high school ball. So we know the reason why they didn't play regular season games. Perfect. Okay. Uh, this was a question early on that I think you dealt with. Do we need to fill out medical forms in blue ink? Okay, yeah, we've talked about that a few times. So, yes, they do need to fill them out in blue ink. And once again, they are optional, but highly recommended for TOC and All Stars in the book. And I think this question came. Uh, before we got to that point, does senior softball all-stars require a pitching record? No, there's no pitching restrictions in seniors to my recollection. I think it's asking about pitching record. I'm thinking that it refers to the pitching affidavit that's within the all-star affidavit. Is, what are they asking, if it's required? Uh, yes. Well, I mean, I'm assuming it's going to be printed out and put in there, but I mean, with no pitching restrictions, I don't know why they would need it. Well, I'll, I'll interject real quick. It is possible in uh, tournaments down the road that you could play up to three games in one day in senior divisions softball. So the pitching record would become important because there are restrictions on pitching the following day if you pitch so many innings. Okay. So basically you're saying it. You're talking probably from state or a higher level. But it should be in the book every game so we know who pitched. Okay, fair enough. Uh, what happens if there are coaches and players on a team living outside the boundaries? Is this for all star? I would assume so. It doesn't specify. Well. For all stars, if a player has already, if, it, if they've been certified through district with the proper paperwork, then as far as I'm concerned, they're good to go. Um, we just get the paperwork, certify each child, whether it's through school or residency. And if they show the proper paperwork and they're going, I mean, I, I would assume Ted would say that uh, if someone's questioning somebody of that nature, it's up to them to prove us prove elsewise you know you know we have we're not going to go out and start hunting down every kid to make sure all the paperwork's correct i'm going to believe the question asked does a kid that's on the team for the first time who lives outside the boundary is they are they eligible the answer would be no this would be for a brand new player ted certainly okay uh, this is something that will be covered in a little bit. What is player and coach replacement? So that's from the all-star affidavit, and we'll get to that. Um, okay. Uh, do you have a preference? And if so, what lineup cards you prefer we use? And I will say I can answer that. Uh, that will be covered later in the uh, uh, presentation. Somebody writes, I'm unclear on the manager's certification mentioned early. The player's birth certificate, copy, or actual? Well, basically on the birth certificate, and these are for new players only. If you have a player that's already played All-Stars, we do not need a birth certificate. So on a new player, you're going to have to provide an original birth certificate that's got the emboss stamp on it. And uh, give, the coach will put it in his binder, and whoever is bringing those binders to certification on June 17th, district will certify those kids as long as everything looks good, 
and then your coach will give back the birth certificate. But it has to be a birth certificate with the county seal on it, not something that's a photocopy. We actually need both, Phil. We need the original that we can validate, and then they need to bring a copy with them. And what's the copy for? For us to keep on file. Oh, for you? Okay, got it. All right. They don't need to keep anything on that. No, they don't. The copy is just for us. Got it. All right. Okay. Uh, going back, somebody clarified their question of what happens if players on a team are living outside the boundaries, and that is in reference to all stars. So again, they wouldn't be eligible. Okay. Uh, if a coach completed the trainings, required trainings last year, are they required again? From what I've learned and what I was told that they have to do them each year. So look at your date of completion. Uh, and we have a question that's about dress code, but we will be addressing dress code in a little bit. That's all we have. Okay, great. Okay, all-star replacement of manager, coach, or player. So replacement, so temporary replacement of a coach or manager, permanent replacement of a coach or manager, or permanent replacement of a player. So temporary replacement of coach or manager can be done by the TD just before your game is about to begin or sometime before. Um, there's a spot there for a one-day replacement. Say somebody gets called into work and they just can't get around it. Uh, there's no background check required. Just need an approval letter from the league president saying whoever is replacing is okay by the, by the league president. The TD shall enter temporary replacement name and date and sign in the space below the permanent replacement section. Permanent replacement of a manager or coach. So on a permanent replacement, you need the authorization letter from league president stating that you're replacing the manager or coach permanently. With heavy line, TD will cross out the manager, coach being replaced on the affidavit and then the TD will enter replacement name and signature. So a permanent player replacement. So a 24 hour notice needed for district, for district director, Ted Boet. Ted Boet appointed ADA or host of the TD will review all supporting documents for new player before the next game. So basically, um, any new player you're bringing in, you're going to have to get the same paperwork that you got for your original team um, players before that game. And a uh, 24-hour notice, meaning that you're going to have to let them know. So, for example, if you have a player you want to add, notify Ted so he can make sure that he's got a proper uh, or an authorized person to be at your game, whenever that game is, to make sure he approves that new player. The player removed will have name struck through and new player will be added. For fuller discussion of how permanent and temporary coach managers and permanent player replacements are made, consult the 1023 Tournament District Handbook on District 4 Forms page and the PDF copy of the presentation on the District 4 Forms page in which the process is addressed in depth. Okay, game preparation, getting ready for the games. Okay, inform parents about expectations at the site. So before the game, and this is meaning you're talking to them maybe at your last practice or one of your practices before you start heading to the location you're going to, you need to tell your parents to leave their pets at home, not to bring them at the games. There is no alcohol at these games. There is no drugs. No tobacco products, that's chewing tobacco, cigarettes, whatever. None of that can be at a Little League sponsored event. No outside food, no coolers, and no noisemakers, air hose. 
Very important that you coaches tell your families this. The reason for no outside food, no coolers, is basically because the cities that are hosting these tournaments, um, it costs them money to host these tournaments for different expenses, for different things they're doing. The only way they can refurbish their money is by their concession stand. And we ask that all the leagues support that and all the teams coming in. I've seen teams come in with outside barbecuing on the, at the facilities. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, like you said, we're trying to make, the, we're just trying to break even basically because those leagues, those own leagues that are hosting the tournament, they have their cost, whether it's for equipment, softball, prepping the field, um, paying city fees to use the field. That's the only way they can refurbish it. And when we say no coolers, there can be a cooler allowed uh, in the dugout for the players for water or ice, et cetera. And then once again, the no noise makers, we've had problems with that in the past where people are bringing horns and stuff. It's just too much of a distraction. Um, and we ask that you don't bring those. Tournament game schedules and information. So this District 4 website, you see the link with the arrow there, tournament. It's going to show you the Tournament of Champions schedule, obviously 2023, and the All-Star schedule. Um, those are the, when you click those, and you're going to bring up all the schedules or any, if there's any particular one you're looking for. All the other years you see on there are all past schedules that have winners um, of what they've done in the past. Also, there's also team photos of all the winners as well. So this would be the Tournament of Champions page for 2023. You just click the division and it'll show you a bracket. Pretty cut and dry. It'll show you the bracket, the games. Um, right there, it'll show, there you go right there. So there's the game side. So for example, that's the uh, 2023 District Four Tournament of Champions, Senior Softball. It shows the two teams playing, uh, the date, the time, and the location of the game. And there is the home page there. You can also look on uh, um, Facebook and or Twitter to find out information as well. Dress code, DOC and all stars dress code. So why a dress code? The reason we have a dress code is you're representing your league, your community, your district, and you're representing Little League. You are setting an example for the players and the spectators. All eyes are on you guys. Your example begins with your attire and continues more importantly with your behavior on the field and off the field. District 4 and Northern California dress code form does not need to be signed by the manager and coaches, and it does not need to be in the binder. The league president, the affirmation page attests that the manager and coaches know the dress code. The dress code, however, will be strictly enforced. There are the forms right there, the link for the dress code. And that is the form that the president and our president, I'm sorry, the manager and the two coaches will sign. So TOC all-star dress code for coaches and managers. This is what acceptable. <clears throat> as far as pants goes, solid color, docker style pants, black or hem short. Shorts must be a maximum of two inches below or above the knees. Shorts can be worn. Managers and coaches must be of the same color, black, short, or short. Shirt, collared shirt, or Team jersey in TOC tucked into pants. Coaches and manager shirts must match. Uh, TOC and all star dress code for the coaches and managers acceptable. So, team hat or visor with bill forward may be worn. Shoes or closed toed shoes, so obviously no sandals or whatever like that. You got, it's got to be closed shoes. 
And if you're in juniors or seniors, you can wear a full uniform, but it just can't be one of you. It's got to be all three of you, or depending on how many coaches you have, three, two, or one. Everyone has to be the same. Not acceptable. There's no cutoff. There's no cargo pants with all those bulky pockets and uh, real baggy type. Um, baggy pockets, no denim shorts or pants. Don't come on the field wearing your hat backwards or to the tip to the side. It's going to be worn properly straight ahead. And like I said, open toe shoes or sandals, metal cleats. None of that is legal to be on the field. The manager or dress code code penalty. So a manager or coach that goes up to the game not conforming to the dress code will be confined to the dugout and not allowed on the field both prior to and during the game. Meaning if you don't have the proper clothing and you're not even involved in pregame warmups. So make sure you guys take care of that, okay? And it's tucked in, it's nice, it's neat, and you're not looking sloppy. If no adults conform to this dress code, the TD will appoint one adult for the plate meeting and team will have no adult base coaches during the game. Player uniform, team uniform, team hat or visor optional for players, but butt worn bill forward. All stars in TOC. The Little League packed, old or new style, properly attached is required. No sublimation or silk screen little league packs is allowed. Eye black allowed, but only single line under each eye. I've been seeing a lot of these kids lately. I mean, they're doing a complete face, uh, face paint with the black, uh, the black, the eye black, and it's just one single line under each eye. That's it. That's all. It's, it's, I, uh, that's all what it's made for, and that's what we're doing. Um, and then the Little League patches, if you have them, great. If you don't have them, I would suggest letting your president know that he needs to get on it and get them quickly so you have them for your TOC and All-Star. One to three players without a Little League patch, one adult base coach will be eliminated. So if you got one to three players without a patch, one adult base coach eliminated. Four or more players without the patch, then you lose both your coaches and kids will be doing the bases on their own. Team arrival and pre-game. So arrival at the game site, the first thing you want to do is find the tournament director and confirm game. Go TD your team binder with all the form. What At that point, basically what he'll do is he'll take your binder and he'll start going through it after he's taking care of business with you guys and uh, keep it with him until the game's over. Um, you'll get a lineup card from the tournament director to fill out. Uh, do not separate any of the copies. Only the umpire and chief of play meeting does that. So you're going to don't show up with the lineup card that somebody else gave you at the game. The tournament director will give it to you when you show up and then you can fill it out and then uh, presented at the plate meeting for the umpire. The TD will provide all softballs. You don't have to worry about any of the softballs for the game. And only a manager and up to two coaches listed on the TOC roster or all-star affidavit are allowed on the field. Meaning that when the game, you guys are just showing up and everyone's starting to go on the field, we can't have extra coaches on the field. It's three adults, one manager, two coaches on each field, on each side of the field. That will be it. Nobody else will be allowed. One, that's another thing when you talk to your team about all these other items I've discussed. Let them know it's just the three. Managers and coaches must have government issued photo identification to confirm POC and all star name. Make copy on to one, you can copy all three onto one page if that's easier, whatever you prefer for the uh, coach photo identifications and leave it in the binder. The coin toss. So the coin toss, all game sites are considered neutral. So prior to entering on the field itself, when you meet with the TD, he will do the coin toss with both managers. The team that traveled the furthest will call heads or tails. 
the winner of the toss will be home or visitor, depending on what he chooses. The loser of the toss will then choose the dugout. Filling out the lineup card. So on the lineup card, we need first and last names of players and manager and coaches. All that, because all these people are going to be announced, and we need the first and last names. List all eligible players. Include all their jersey numbers. Include position for your starting nine by number. Example, catcher two, shortstop six, whatever. You take care of that. Do not separate lineup copies, as we said earlier. Maybe shared with the official scorekeeper. So once you get it filled out, you may have a scorekeeper come up and ask you for the lineup. Uh, nowadays, it's a lot easier. We can instead of just taking the lineup from you and let, give it to the scorekeeper. He can just take a picture of it with his phone, and then he has it right there, and you can hang out to your lineup. And there it is. So there's a spot where all the numbers of the jersey goes, first and last name. Since it's all continuous batting, it's real cut and dry. And then the positions of the players that are actually playing. Uh, you got the date, home, visitor, all that stuff. That's what your uh, lineup card will look like when the tournament director gives it to you. In seniors, they will only bat nine. Once again, that is the only division that does not have continuous batting. Warm-ups. So like I said, the manager and the two coaches are the only ones allowed in warm-ups on the field. In all-stars, unlike you guys have been doing this year now with the new rule change, in all-stars, no coach may warm up a pitcher. Before, you guys have been doing it all year. In most cases, I think, with most of the leagues, that the coaches have been warming up pitchers. Not in all. You can still do it in TLC, but not in All-Stars. Once again, you'll have to have your catcher um, with the gear on warming up your pitcher, just like it was in the past. Um, adults are allowed to hit, but not catch in bullpen or on the field. So if you're hitting infield to your players, make sure your catcher is the one receiving the ball. And of course, he's going to have to have his mask on with a throat protector. <clears throat> Warm up. Players with bats or near bats must wear batting helmets. Catcher warming up. Pitcher must have a catcher's helmet and a dangling throat guard. If you don't have that stuff now, if, you, if you're missing some throat guards, talk to your president, get them all taken care of before you come to the game. You don't want to be wasting time looking for parts and stuff when you're trying to get your team prepared to play the first game. Catcher fielding infield, outfield practice must have a catcher's helmet on as well. So if you got an, a coach hitting some fly balls out to left field from the side over there, the person, <clears throat> the player receiving the ball from those, uh, the ones catching it, he's got to have a catcher's mask on. So very important. You might want to have uh, at least two catcher's helmets with you. Warm up. Home team allowed field 10 minutes, 30 minutes before game time. So basically, the visiting team allowed field for 10 minutes, 20 minutes before game time. And then when team is taking warm up, the opposing team may not be on the field. So basically, if team A is hitting infield, the other team must be in the dugout, not standing out on the field in the outfield still playing catch. Vice versa. And then the last 10 minutes before the game will be introductions. We'll introduce the players. We'll go through um, the uh, Star Spangled Banner, all that uh, Winter League Pledge, everything, and we'll be good to go. Umpires will inspect equipment before each game, so place all your bats, helmets, and catcher's equipment outside the dugout in orderly fashion. If any of the equipment is in the dugout, it must come out for inspection. If you got players that carry two or three bats in their backpack and they don't use them for the games, it's just there for looks or whatever it is, I would suggest not even bring them out. Just bring the bats they're going to use. What the umpire is looking for in bats are cracks, dents, anything bent, separating, etc. Illegal bats, baseball bats, no sticky substances, even if dried, maximum two and a quarter barrel. And then those are all the lengths and BPF 1.20, 1.15 is not allowed. 
and you see the rest of it there. Batting helmets, we're looking for the no stay logo, logo, excessive decal stickers and repainting. They're looking for that stuff. Um, cracks, missing, torn padding, loose and missing screws on face guards. Yeah, one thing I, it happens quite a bit is, and sometimes the coach misses it. Um, the kids that have face masks on their helmets, make sure all the screws are in there and make sure they're tight. Sometimes we go up and the kid pulls his helmet out and one of the screws are missing and nobody has any spare parts and now he can't use his, uh, can't use his helmet. So check all that stuff. Make sure, I know these kids all keep their own helmets in their own bags, but just check them out and make sure they're all good. So that once again, it's not something that you have to deal with as you're right now, probably about 20 minutes before the game as the umpires are inspecting or 30 minutes before the game. You don't want to be running around looking for parts and screwdrivers and all that. So check all that out at one of your practices and make sure they're good. C-flap, cheek guard, same manufacturer as helmet, and no new holes drilled in helmet. On the catcher's helmet, no skull cap. They're looking for, what umpires are looking for on catcher's helmet, no skull cap, the no K logo, cracked or missing on torn padding, screws are in place, the cure for face guard, dangling throat guard, catcher's gear, damaged or missing buckles or straps. All defective and illegal equipment will be handed to TD to keep during the game. What managers can do to aid inspection. At a practice before games have begun, have your players lay out. There you go. This is basically what I said before. Have it checked out. Check your equipment. Make sure they're all good. Tell them not to bring any defective or illegal equipment to the game that you find. Tell your players not to bring any equipment to the dugout that will not be used during the game. Also on that equipment as well, once the game is over, we've got a lot of people where equipment was taken out because it wasn't Little League certified by the umpires. It gets put in the score booth or wherever the uh, TD puts them. Don't forget to pick them up after the game because otherwise it could get misplaced, lost, and you may never see it again. Um, Pre-game ceremonies. Both teams, managers, coaches will be announced. Volunteer Little League umpires from Victor Four will be announced. National Anthem or Pledge of Allegiance and then the Little League Pledge. And this is all happening 10 minutes before game time. Plate meeting attended by only managers and team captains are optional. Teams and coaches remain in the dugout while this is going on. Nobody's warming up pitchers, nobody's taking in field while the managers are talking to the umpire. Unseparated lineup beginning with the home team given to the umpire in chief. Control of field now shift to from TD to umpire. Managers must answer yes when asked if players are properly equipped, which includes the equipment they're using. Make sure all the girls or boys uh, in baseball, no jewelry are allowed. Um, so make sure all that, uh, when they ask you that, make sure the cleats, uh, they're going to ask you about cleats, meaning that they have the proper cleats and not metal cleats for the younger ones. Um, and then the ground rules will be explained by the TD or the UIC as far as the field you're playing at. All right, Jim, what questions have we got today on this one? Okay, we actually do have a number of questions. A number of folks were actually asking uh, similar questions. Um, so we have the person who uh, asked the question earlier about the player outside the boundary uh sorry to go back but if a new player is ineligible to play for all stars because they live outside the boundaries is there a waiver and also do coaches have to live within the boundaries so to my recollection I, the coaches can live outside the boundaries as far as i know i've never heard that before of that being an issue and the, you know the players actually and i don't know if the players can live outside the boundaries too if they go to school in that town. They could, you know, someone playing in Pinole could live in Martinez, but if they go to school in Pinole, they're they're good. Um, hopefully that answers the question that they're okay. uh, looking for. 
Uh, we have actually a whole, the most questions about this issue. Uh, speakers with walk-up songs, is this going to be allowed in All Stars? And will teams be allowed to play music from a speaker before the game and between innings? Well, uh, Chad, I'm going to let you answer that one because I know some leagues do it, some leagues don't. I know in Martinez, we do not do walk-up music for the players. I don't know if other leagues do or not. So if there's walk-up music played for one team, it has to be played for the other team. There can be no favoritism for one side or the other. Um, and it's up to the local site to decide how they're going to do it. I'm fine with that. But okay. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. Okay. Okay. Uh, for TOC, can coaches and managers wear matching T-shirts if they are not collared or jerseys? Meaning like if they can just all wear three black T-shirts? Um, I would assume that the question can be broken into two parts. Can they wear just a plain T-shirt or can they wear a T-shirt that is that has their team logo on it? Maybe, you know, Coach Bill on the back. As far as they're all matching with their team shirt or a collared shirt that the all the players match, I'm fine. I don't think we're not allowing someone just to come in wearing three white T-shirts or whatever. So as long as it's a team have your team shirt or a collared shirt that's all we need okay is there a restriction on the color of eye black two people ask this uh, you know the i don't know jim is there well to me it's called eye black for a reason <laughs> i mean true. if if it i've never seen any other color yeah i haven't either uh, maybe some people have eye black that matches their uh, jersey colors. Ted, do you want to weigh in on this? Well, I have seen other colors. I don't have a problem with it, with it again as long as it matches or, or meets the criterion that it's a, a line underneath the eye and not a war paint type style. Okay. Uh, what, what sleeve does the Little League patch need to be on? The instructions are on the pack when you get it, but I believe, Jim, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it the left side? It is the left side uh, between the shoulder and the end of the sleeve. And I know if in some jerseys with the girls, if they don't have sleeves, if it's sleeveless, then it goes on the left side on the chest, right? Correct. Basically where your logo is on your shirt. Correct. Okay. Uh, will we get a copy of this deck to ensure we don't miss anything? Copy of what? Uh, will we get a copy of this deck, uh, the uh, PowerPoint deck, to ensure that we don't miss anything? Um, this is being recorded, I believe, Jim, isn't it? Um, I, I think there will be three different ways you'll be able to get this. The first is that it's being recorded and it will be put on the District 4 YouTube site. It will also, if you go to that forms page, uh, a PDF copy of this presentation will be posted there. And also at the end of this meeting, Ted Boet will be sending an email to everybody who was registered. And that uh, PDF handout will be one of the uh, attachments to that. Perfect. Okay, um, this will have to be divided up into All Stars and TOC, but this is something we will cover soon, and that is kind of uh, team play with eight players. Is that that's something that's? Um... It will be covered. Okay. Um, and Ted, you may want to cover this because you covered it last night. Will Game Changer private streaming slash recording be allowed with a proper acceptance contract with parents? Well, there's multiple reasons, most likely not. The biggest is, is that according to Little League, and we can certainly send you the information, not only do you need the permission of both teams and every player and every parent, 
you need the permission of wherever the game's being recorded on or from permission. So let's just say you're playing at Alameda. Oh, we'll pick a softball site. So let's say you're playing in Martinez at Hidden Lakes Park. You would need permission from the city of Martinez to broadcast that game uh, on Game Changer. Okay. Um, in addition to the opponents are playing as well with all those families. And that is correct. If one if one person objects to it being broadcast, then it can't be broadcast. And if everyone agrees to it, is there a certain limitations on where they can broadcast it from? If everybody agrees and you have the authority from wherever the field is at, there's no limitations. Okay. Uh, this is something that will be covered later. Can an adult coach uh, catch during infield warm-up? So that will be covered later. Uh, are metal cleats allowed for seniors? Yes, they are. That is the only division, I believe, correct, Jim? Uh, for TOC, yes, for All Stars Juniors also. Yeah. And somebody confirms that, yes, they have red uh, uh, eye black. So they call it eye red, I guess. I guess so. Okay. Okay, that's all the questions we have for right now, Phil. Great. Thanks, Jim. Okay, we're starting the game. POC playing rules for the game. The following rules, unless noted by an exception, apply to all POC divisions of play. Number of adult coaches. May have up to three adults, a manager and two coaches. Number of players, a game may begin and or continue with a team of eight or more players. Mandatory play for TOC. For the purpose of satisfying the requirements of mandatory play, a player must bat once and play six defensive outs. Triple A softball innings limited to five runs, except unlimited six and subsequent inning. A five run inning is equivalent of three defensive outs. Senior softball, a team with a roster of 15 or more players with at least 15 eligible to play in that game may have a mandatory play of one at bat and three defensive outs. Mandatory play for the purpose of satisfying the requirements of mandatory play when appearing offensively for the first time in the game, the player must step in the batter's box with no count and the player must remain in the game until one of the following occurs. He or she is retired as a batter, or he or she is retired as a batter slash runner, or he or she reaches base and scores, or after he or she reaches the base, the inning or game ends. Interpretation, when batting for the first time, a player reaching base may not be replaced with a pinch runner. Once again, when a batting for the first time, a player reaching base may not be replaced with a pinch runner, special pinch runner, or courtesy runner. No proper substitutions are allowed for a first time batter. In all divisions of TOC except seniors, mandatory play tracker will be kept during the game by the scorekeeper. Managers must tell the scorekeeper each defensive half inning which players are sitting that in. Once all players on a team have met their defensive mandatory play requirement of six defensive outs, in minor division, a five run half inning equals three out. The log will no longer be kept. So basically, coaches, you're letting the scorekeeper know each inning like you would on a pitching change who's sitting out that inning so we can keep track and make sure all the mandatory play is taken care of. And this is the form. So basically, it's like a lineup card similar. Each player is listed on there, and then they'll be marked if they're sitting out and making sure that everyone gets at least their minimum play. Triple A and majors continuous batting order, seniors bat nine. This is TOC once again. Continuous batting order, substitution. 
Defensive substitutions may be made freely. Player and what that means is basically you just flip flop them any way you want as long as they get their minimum play. There's no, you're not substituting in for anybody, just defensively, any way you want to do it there. Players still must play six defensive outs at some point in the game. Also, back to that real quick, I, sometimes I heard some questions asked the other night about baseball. They do not have to be six consecutive. They can play in the second inning, the fifth inning, just as long as you make sure you get them all taken care of. I would suggest getting it taken care of as soon as possible so you don't have any kind of, you forgot to do it at the end, and then you have to deal with the penalties of that and everything. Uh, senior softball only substitutions. Any player who has been removed for a substitute may re-enter the game, but only in the same position in the batting order. A substitute entering the game for the first time may not be removed until mandatory play is met. Once starter and substitute meet mandatory play, there are free substitutions. Once again, this is senior only. Multiple players may re-enter and re-enter in the same batting order spot. If a team has no eligible substitutes, the opposing manager will choose a player not in the batting order to substitute for an injured player, ill or ejected. Meaning if you have someone that's got to leave the game and you've already used your substitute, the umpire is going to go to the opposing manager and ask him to pick a player on your lineup to be back in the game. Run rules for AAA and majors. Game in when team is ahead by 15 after three. 10 after four and eight after five. And then you see in parentheses what happens if it's the home team. And for seniors, it's 15 after four, 10 after five, and eight after six. Same thing in parentheses with the home team. There are no time limits, on, which obviously a lot of you guys may have had time limits during the season in TOC, but in uh, or during the season in TOC, there is absolutely no time limit. So ending the game, TOC ending the game, suspended game. Any game in which a winner cannot be determined shall be resumed at the point of suspension. Regulation games call for darkness, weather, or cure or curfew are complete if a winner can be determined. If a regulation game is ended in an incomplete inning, the score will revert back to the last completed inning, provided the visiting team scores one or more runs to tie or go ahead, and the home team does not tie the score or take the lead during the incomplete game. You know, basically on a, these games, I mean, it doesn't get dark till 8.30, so I can't imagine some of these games not getting finished. But if it happens because of the no time limit, um, we'll just have to deal with it accordingly, which we'll talk about. Um, majors and C, uh, foot in the batter box. Okay, TOC foot in the box and third strike not caught. So majors and seniors, batter must keep at least one foot partially in the batter's box during the at-bat, unless one of several exceptions in Rule 6.02C are met. All penalties will be enforced. Third strike not caught. Majors and seniors only. The batter becomes a runner if the third strike is not caught in flight with first base open or two outs. POC courtesy runner and special pinch runner. Majors and seniors courtesy runner is allowed in majors and seniors only. Special pinch runner is seniors only. Not more than once per inning. A player not currently in the lineup may be a special pinch runner for any offens offensive player. A player may not be special pinch runner for more than once per game. This is not considered a substitution. Stealing of signs. Majors and seniors only. The stealing of signs is considered unsportsmanlike behavior. If an umpire suspects the stealing of signs by a manager, coach, or player, that person will be warned. If it happens again, that person shall be ejected. Protest. Protestable situations. Awarding of bases. 
rules interpretation, mandatory play rule violation, ineligible pitcher or player, non-protestable situation, umpire's judgment, the equipment, ejection, protest occurs after next pitch or play. Protest. All play stops during a protest, and play only resumes when protest is resolved. Games cannot be played under protest. Even if the protest is over an umpire's judgment, the protest must be allowed to continue. The UIC, umpire in chief, does not decide what is or is not protestable. You must be made in accordance with Rule 4.19, made before the pitch play or attempt to play. All umpires confer, make ruling. If manager does not agree, may continue protest. This is TOC we're talking about. The umpire and crew chief will report conditions of protest to the tournament director. Tournament director will make the decision. Tournament director may use the protest committee if he chooses to or she. Tournament director's decision is final and no further appeals may be made. Play resumes after decision is made. Minor division, TOC pitching. Maximum of three innings pitched per game, no rest required between games. Major division pitching. Maximum of 12 innings pitched per game, one day rest required if you go six or more innings, no limit of innings pitched per week. If fewer than five innings pitched in a game, may pitch up to 12 innings the next game. If five or more innings are pitched in a game, may only pitch up to four innings in the next game, no matter the number of days of rest. Once again, this is DOC. Senior division TOC, maximum of 12 innings pitched per game, no days or rest required. No limit of innings pitched per week. If fewer than six innings is pitched in a game, may pitch up to 12 innings in the next game. If six or more innings pitched in a game, may only pitch up to five innings in the next game, no matter the number of days between games. All-star playing rules. So this is going to be a little different than TOC if you're involved in coaching the All-Star Tournament. The following are rules, unless noted by exception, apply to all softball divisions in play. Number of coaches. A team may have a manager and up to two coaches, no matter the number of players on the team. This is a new rule for 2023, um, which I think is, is a good rule. The number of players a game may not begin or continue with a team of fewer than nine players. Unlike POC, where you could have eight, All-Stars, you must have nine. Softball and pitching distance, eight to 10 year old. Uh, use the 11 inch ball, 35 feet. Nine to 11, use 12 inch, 40 feet. Little League uses 12 inch, 40 feet. And junior and senior, 12 inch, 43 feet. Use of an illegal bat. If a player steps into a batter's box with an illegal bat and it is discovered before the following batter steps into the batter box, then the player is out unless the defensive manager elects to accept the outcome of the play. The player and manager are ejected. The team loses one coach position for the remainder of the game. The illegal bat is all is always removed from the game. Batting order for junior division and below. All divisions up to juniors, excluding seniors, is continuous. So depending how many kids are on your roster that show up for that game, everybody will bat, whether it's nine players or it's 14 players, everyone bats. Mandatory play with continuous batting order is new in 23, juniors and below. So all roster players in uniform at the start of the game will be in the batting order. There are no defensive mandatory play requirements. So you don't have to play everybody one inning or two innings as long as, because they will be batting. Players may be entered or re-entered defensively any time during the game. And improper batter will be considered as batting out of turn. 
Okay. Um, a late arriving player, if the manager chooses, will be added to the end of the batting order. A player who must leave the game will have place in batting order skipped over with no out required. I'm sorry, no out recorded. The player may return and will go back into the original batting order spot. A player unable to complete a plate appearance due to ejection, injury, or illness will have next player in batting order take his or her spot and assume the existing count. A batter who reaches base and is unable to run the bases due to injury, illness, or ejection will be replaced by the player who made the last out or, if, if, if eligible, a courtesy runner. A batter reaching base for the first time in the game is still required to run the bases. A courtesy runner cannot be used in this case. Uh, Phil? Yes. Uh, on the batter reaching base for the first time in the game uh, is uh, still required to run the bases. That's the rule that we use in TOC. That's right. the regular season rule. This is actually a new interpretation for all stars, and we don't have confirmation of this but it looks like this will be the rule but there is this is a little bit up in the air at this point point. and when when do we when will we expect an answer for that uh i would say within a week okay so if something changes we will send a message to all the presidents who let the coaches know yes okay great umpire responsibility for mandatory play with continuous batting order this is also new in 23. So there is no longer responsibility for umpires to track defensive substitutions for mandatory play with the continuous batting order is used. Umpires must still track all pitching and courtesy runner changes. Umpires must track pitchers and all softball up to little league, 10 to 12 year olds, who have been removed from circle and leave the game defensively at any point and are thus ineligible to return to the circle. Senior softball only. Batting order is nine, no mandatory play. A starter removed for a substitute, including a DH, may re enter the game once, but only in the same batting order spot. A substitute non starter removed from the game may not re enter the game. Any of the game run rules. And this is similar to, I believe, TOC. So it's uh, 15 runs after three, 10 after four. And then we got 15 after four and 10 after five in juniors and seniors. Um, and accordingly, you know, obviously with the principles of the home team, it's a four and a half, three and a half, and three and a half, two and a half. The regular season eight run rule is not used at all. There are no time limits in All-Star, and any game in which a winner cannot be determined shall be resumed at the point of suspension. Regulations games call for darkness, weather, curfew, or complete are complete if a winner can be determined. If in a regulation game the visiting team ties or takes the lead in the top half of the inning and the, and the home team cannot complete its half inning or take the lead, the game is suspended and resumed at the point of suspension. The game does not revert back to the previous inning. If a game is tied at the start of an eighth inning in Little League, 10 to 12 year olds and below, ninth inning in intermediate juniors and seniors, and any subsequent inning, the batter scheduled to bat last, that inning will be placed on second base to start the inning. Eligible substitutes and special pitch runners are allowed for senior division. Is this basically Jim the international rule? Pardon? Is this basically the international rule as far as tie games go? It's very similar to it. Yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> uh, one thing, if you uh, may come up, I don't, and I'm not even sure if it was uh, mentioned, but um, if a game is called because of a tie, and it's, and it's going to be 
or suspended and is going to be continued. It'll be continued prior to a game that's already scheduled that you would be playing it if you won the game. Um, so make sure you look at your brackets and schedules and check that if a game does get suspended so you know what's happening there and stay in communication with that with everyone. Um, foot in the box and third strike not caught. So foot in the batter's box. Batter must keep at least one foot partially in the box during the bat unless one of several expectations and ER3A are met. All penalties will be enforced. Third strike not call all division except eight to ten year olds. The batter becomes a runner and the, the batter becomes a runner if the third strike is not caught in flight with first base open or two outs. Courtesy runner, junior divisions and below. A courtesy runner is allowed for the pitcher and or catcher of record when there are two outs, except for their first at bat. It must be the player who made the last out. That's a new rule in this year. Special pinch runner, senior division only, twice in a game, but not more than once per inning. A player may, a player not currently in the lineup may be a special pinch runner for any offensive player. A player may not be special pinch runner for more than once per game. This is not considered a substitution. Dealing of signs. So the stealing of signs is considered unsportsmanlike behavior. If an umpire suspects the stealing of signs by a manager, coach, or player, that person will be warned. If it happens again, that person will be ejected. Protestable situations, and this is kind of similar here. So awarding of bases, rules interpretation, mandatory play violation, and eligible pitcher or player. Non-protestable is the judgment of an umpire. Uh, equipment, ejection. Protest occurs after the next pitch or play. All play stops during a protest and play only resumes when protest is resolved. Games cannot be played under protest. Even if the protest is over an umpire's judgment, the protest must be allowed to continue. The umpire, the UIC, does not decide what is or is not protestable. When a formal verbal protest is made by a manager to the umpire in chief, umpire conference and render decision. If unresolved, the umpire consults with TD to contact the district administrator. If unresolved, the TD or DA will call Western Region Headquarters. And if that's not anything, if, it, if it's unresolved, then they'll protest goes to the tournament committee in Williamsport for a final decision. So if you as a coach are protesting something and you're very adamant that uh, you think you're right, you can take it all the way to uh, Williamsport to get the final decision. Okay, pitching. Calendar days of rest. This is Little League, 10 to 12, 1 to 6 innings. If you got a pitcher that pitches 6 innings one day, they're good to go. Uh, it's only when you go into that 7th inning in 10 to 12, basically an extra inning game, that uh, they have to have one day rest. Maximum innings per day is 12. A player removed as a pitcher, but remaining in the game defensively may return as a pitcher any time in the game but only once in the same inning as she has removed. No limit to the number of pitchers used in the game. Next. When the pitcher has the ball in the pitching circle and the runner is on base, that runner may not legally disengage from the base until eight to 10, the ball reaches the batter or is struck, or all other divisions is when the, the pitcher releases the ball during the pitch. Questions? Do we have any questions, Dan? Yes, we do. Okay, what do we got? Okay. Um... Just want to make sure everybody's on board with the uh, metal cleats uh, in TOCs. The only division that can have metal cleats is seniors in because we don't have juniors uh, in TOC in all stars. 
uh, juniors and seniors can wear metal cleats. Um, a catcher cannot have a courtesy runner for the first at bat, correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, to confirm, if we have four managers on the roster, and I'm assuming that means four coaches, one manager, three coaches on the roster, but only three per game, are we able to interchange them depending on availability for games? Is that correct? And I'm going to assume that this is for TOC. So TOC roster only has a spot for a manager and two coaches. So once those three names are entered, that's what you're stuck with for the remaining of that tournament. And then would that be different for All-Stars, Phil? All-Stars, the affidavit only has a spot for a manager and two coaches. So if they want to replace a coach, not during the game, but before the game begins, there are spots on there for them to add a replacement coach. If somebody gets called into work, they can put a coach in there for a temporary replacement. Okay. Uh, can a catcher that pitches pitch in the same game they catch? Well, that's more of a baseball rule to my understanding, isn't it, Jim? Correct. There are no restrictions on catcher to pitcher or pitcher to catcher in softball at any level. If, if a runner is at third and wants to steal home, is batter allowed to step out of box? Jim, I'll let you take that one. Okay. Uh, assuming that the uh, pitch has been made, uh, and the runner is allowed to disengage uh, from the base, uh, the batter will need to step out of the box if the batter were actually to stay there and interfered with the play, either the batter or the runner would be out. Uh, I would suggest that uh, folks look at that, that rule on stepping out of the box. I think the easiest way to remember it is this. If a pitch is made, and it's a called strike or ball, and the catcher catches the ball, and the pitcher stays in the pitching circle, and no further play occurs, that batter must stay in the box. In most other situations, they can step out. If there's a play being made at home, if the catcher doesn't catch the, the pitch, if the pitcher steps out of the pitching circle in all those situations or the batter swings, uh, they can step out of the box. Uh, if we are without one of our coaches, are the players allowed to coach a base? So I'm assuming you're saying that they only have a manager and a coach. Obviously, there has to be one adult in the dugout at all times. So yes, one of the players with a batting helmet on can coach one of the bases. As long as the whole key is the whole key is an adult in the dugout. Yes, and uh, that's a good emphasis there on that. Uh, and also within Little League, you are required to have base coaches. Uh, should the manager say protest? instead of time to avoid timeout rules. Jim, you wanna, talk, you wanna yes. talk about how you would like to see it happen? Yes, um, just because a manager calls time doesn't mean we automatically um, uh, record a visit to the pitcher. So if a manager calls time and comes to the umpire, that will not be regarded as a visit to your pitcher. Uh, when you are protesting, part of the rule is you actually do have to use the language, I protest, and then explain exactly what you are protesting to the umpire. Uh, for the pitch re release, is it still at the hip, even if pitcher has not released the ball yet, that a runner can get off the base in uh, 9 11 division and above. Jim, isn't it pitch release? 
It's considered pitch release, but that's difficult for umpires to determine. So what we generally do is when the arm uh, is parallel with the leg uh, and then crosses the leg, at that point, we consider the pitch to have been released. Do catcher's helmets need the separate throat guards that attach or are the newer helmets with the extended front piece that protects the neck okay? And they're referring to a hockey style mask. Yeah, no, all, all catcher's mask in Little League need the dangling throat protector. On a walk, can we steal second? And if we do, could run return runner return to first base if runner goes back? If runner goes back. Well, if he's running to second, he has to continue to go to second unless the pitcher goes to make a play, I assume. That's the way I am understanding that question. Um, I think that uh, if it's on a walk, and the player does not stop on first base while the pitcher has the ball in the circle and the uh, batter runner has just walked, uh, crosses first and continues to second, that is perfectly legal at all levels. But what if they stop in between first and second? You are allowed one stop. And so if you stop between first and second, you then must immediately advance to the next base or retreat to the previous base. Those are all our questions at this point. Yeah, that was easy. All right. Manager and coaches points of emphasis for TOC and All-Star. So points of emphasis for TOC and All-Star umpires. The following are points of emphasis for TOC and All-Stars. They apply to both TOC and All-Stars and all divisions of play unless otherwise noted. Managers and coaches, players, pre-game. So prior to the game, only the managers and up to two coaches are allowed on the field. TOC only. Coaches may warm up pitchers anytime, anywhere, no protective equipment required. Um, and All-Stars only. Coaches may not warm up pitchers. Players with bats must wear batting helmets and warm up. Um, also, prior to the game, a catcher fielding infield practice near a coach with a bat must wear the catcher's helmet with the dangling throat guard. Player warming up a pitcher must have catcher's helmet with that dangling throat guard. During the game, only the manager and two coaches are allowed on the field. The adult must be in a dugout at all times. There are players in the dugout. TOC only, coaches may warm up pitcher. All-star, coaches may not. And in all-stars only, the coaches cannot play any form of catch. During the game, coaches and managers must be inside the dugout. No standing or sitting on buckets outside the dugout during game. Coaches must remain in the dugout between innings and may only take base coaching positions after the catcher throws down after final pitch of warmups. If a player has gates on dugout, they must remain closed during play. Players cannot handle bats in the dugout. Managers, coaches, and players shall not converse with fans or parents. So that's basically stating that once you end the dugout, the coaches and players are communicating with each other, and that's it. Nobody else, unless the manager needs to talk to the umpire. Um, all the parents outside, uh, brothers, sisters, grandmas, grandpas, they're all totally isolated from the players during the game. So make sure all the, all the players have their proper water and everything they need before they enter the dugout. Uh, parents, fans, or coaches down the dugout may not relay information or talk with the managers or coaches. If a team has a scorebook kept outside the dugout, there may be no communication between that scorekeeper and the dugout. Umpires will not relay any information to that scorekeeper. So basically, uh, if you want to keep score, you probably should have your dugout coach keep score of the dugout for you so you can keep track of what's going on if you've got 
something you want to find out about what a batter did the last time they batted, have have your dugout coach keep scoring there. Then you don't have to have that little uh, tempting uh, of asking someone outside the dugout. Umpires, managers, and coaches are not responsible for spectators. The tournament director is responsible for spectator behavior. If spectators are bothering your team, tell the tournament director or an umpire. Have the pitcher and catcher ready to go for warm-up pitches between innings. If catcher is putting on gear, have another player with a catcher's mat warm the pitcher up. In TOC only, coach can do this. When the third out is made, the goal is to begin the next half of the inning, pitching to a batter within one minute. Rule 8.03 stipulates pitcher allowed no more than eight pitches, taking no longer than a minute between innings. Players must remain in the dugout and not leave to chase foul ball or visit the fans. If a player needs to use the restroom, make sure to alert an umpire of the situation. So basically, if your player has to use the restroom, just talk to whether you, what side you're on, whether it's the first or third base umpire. Let them know you have so-and-so number whatever has to use the restroom. But I would, as they're leaving, exiting the dugout, um, I would, I, me as a tournament director, would not have a problem to make sure that whatever player is going to the restroom to make sure their father or mother is walking them there to the bathroom because so they're not going by themselves, especially if you're not familiar with the area. No cell phones or electronic devices are allowed on the field even for scorekeeping purposes. Scorekeeping applications on phones or tablets are allowed in the dugout. No manager, coach, or player may use a phone to communicate unless they are a first responder related to work. The penalty for that is, in Genesis, immediate ejection if someone's on their phone, or do you investigate to find out why they're on the phone? Uh, I will usually always come over and ask why they're using the phone. If they say a score uh, keeping app, uh, I will ask them to show it to me. Um, I personally give a warning uh, the first time, but not all umpires are the same. The rule actually doesn't state we have to give a warning. Okay. Objecting to judgment call. So any umpire's decision which involves judgment, such as, but not limited to, whether a batted ball is fair or foul, whether a pitch is a strike or a ball, or whether a runner is safe or out, is final. No player, manager, coach, or substitute shall object to any such judgment. Objecting includes both verbal and physical demonstration. Anytime there is a question about a call, only the manager, not one of the coaches, the manager will talk with one of the umpires. The manager is the only point of contact for the team. Umpires are required and instructed to only speak with managers. All time, when time is granted, go to the umpire who made the call. <clears throat> manager can ask for help with non-judgment calls but it is up to the calling umpire to seek help or not. EOC and All-Stars are tournaments in which sportsmanship and proper Little League behavior is emphasized for everyone, including managers, coaches, players, umpires, and all tournament officials. Manager, coach ejected must leave sight and sound, permanent removal from team, Second ejection is district four special, oh, excuse me. Second ejection in district four special games cannot participate again in any future district four special game. Local league of ejected adult may impose additional penalties. That's for TOC. For all-star ejections, the manager coach ejected must leave sight and sound. Minimum penalty is one game suspension and may not physically attend team's next game including pre- and post-game meetings with teams. Local League of Adult or Tournament Committee may impose additional penalties. 
players ejected may remain on the team bench or be released to a parent or the tournament director. Players ejected will serve a minimum one game suspension. Additional penalties may be imposed by players league. Real quick on that umpire uh, questioning call, um, just some words of advisement when you're dealing with the umpires. If you want to get the respect as a coach, you need to treat the umpires with the respect. If you're going to go out there and you start raising your voice, that's going to be a red flag immediately. Handle it professionally. When you call time, talk to the umpire in question. Talk in a nice manner. Don't raise your voice so the parents out there can hear you or you're trying to rile them up. Handle it professionally. You'll get a lot further that way than you will starting to cause a scene. Um, I know emotions can get high at certain times in games. I've seen it happen. I got excited a few times in games. But trust me, in the long run, you are. What are you laughing at, Jim? Um, trust me, in the long run, it's better to handle it in a nice professional manner. After the game, pick up the team binder from the tournament director. Review the pitching record for accuracy. TD will require, will require you to initial it by tournament director's signature. Cannot be revised after leaving the facility. So basically, once you've signed it and you've taken the book, and then for some reason you're at home that night, and you said, hey, wait a minute, I messed up or something's wrong here. Done. Done deal. So make sure you got it completely correct before you leave the field. Clean out the dugout, any of your empty water bottles or whatever you have in there and leave the field professionally. If you are continuing in the tournament, check the District 4 website for your next game. Um, also, we will try to announce after each game, most fields I'm sure does this, to help out both teams on when their next game is and location and time. Both managers will immediately report the scores to the phone number that you see, 925-236-1115, that's the text. What to report? You're reporting the two teams that played, the innings, the score. Well, I'm assuming too, you probably should say the division you're in. So the team, the division, innings and score, and if there was any ejections or protests. Assume, assume you are the only one reporting this information. TOC. So after the final out of championship game, the TOC awards to both teams. Local leagues award participation pins to their participants, banner to winning teams. Take winning team photo and send as soon as possible to Ted Boat to post. Um, what I mean by local leagues award participate, so each president was, was given tournament of champion pins for each player that participates in the tournament of champions. So ask your president, if your team is in it, you want your pins to give to your kids. Don't wait till after the tournament. Some of these kids you won't see for next till next season. Um, make sure you get them before or right now while you're practicing for TOC. Get those pins and get them to the kids. All-Stars, Post-League Awards, Championship Bennett, Pennant, participation pins handed out by local leagues to their team. That's the same thing with the TOCs. The president has the pin for your league. Make sure you get them from him and make sure you get them to the kids before the last game. Not at the last game, do it before. So in case you're short thumb, you can get some more and everyone uh, has one. And then take the winning team photo and send as soon as possible to Ted Bolette to post. Review. Frequently check game schedule, and reason is that there's a lot of changes that go on. Teams end up pulling out for whatever reasons, you know, for sickness or who knows. There's all kinds of reasons why teams back out of tournaments in the last minute, and they can happen up to right up to the night before. So check the game schedule, and usually if something gets canceled, the presidents of your league get notified, and hopefully they pass it on to the coaches involved in that. Um, don't forget, bring your team binder to each game. I had a game, was it, I think it was two years ago, the team showed up to the game and they forgot their binder. They had to go back to the city they came from to go get it. 
make sure that's on a checklist before you, the night before your game, just like uh, you know, tell players, get everything that you need the night before so you're not scrambling last minute to get it. Bring team binder to each game. Bring your government issued photo identification to each game and then check in with the tournament director as soon as you show up at the game site and make sure to conform to the dress code. Binder review for TOC. You need the team roster. And these are all the documents on the District 4 website. Manager and coach's names on it, signed by the president. Tipping records to be filled out and signed and initialized after each game. And then the affirmation page is signed by the president, uh, along with the medical relief and the code of conduct. That's for TOC. These are highly recommended but not required. Once again, we're emphasizing you don't have to, but I highly suggest bring your medical releases individually for each player. And then the photocopy of the valid California identification for the manager and coaches. All fair binder review. Eight-page all-star affidavit and boundary map with required signatures. Once again, all this, all your binder for all-stars um, will be completed on June 17th. There is a makeup day on the 19th for something that may go haywire for you, but um, you should get your books back from whoever's taking them to the certification meeting that uh, right after that uh, Saturday or Monday, depending on when you get your book there. Get it as soon as you can. Get it back because um, it has it has all your information you're going to need. Um, so the eight page all and the boundary map with required signatures. Uh, you need the three or more documents confirming parents residency or the full enrollment form the tournament verification form for each player, and then the verification of a valid birth certificate or copy. Um, it's not required in the binder, but as soon as you get the birth certificates back, don't hold on to them. Get them back to the parents immediately. I've seen some times where you go through and all of a sudden turn it over and you forgot to get back two or three birth certificates. It's just a, more of a hassle. So as soon as you get it, get, get rid of it as soon as you can. All-Star Team Binder will contain the following required documents. As we said before, the affirmation pages of the medical release, the code of conduct, and the, uh, the All-Star President's page. And then once again with the medical releases. Any more questions, Jim, or did I do a perfect job? <laughs> Well, you did a perfect job, but we still have uh, questions. Okay, maybe um, we something. Okay, this is uh, these two questions are for TOC. Will base coaches be required to wear helmets when coaching base runners at first and third? No. Only if they're a player, correct? If they're a player, yes, but for an adult, um, they do not. I mean, they can if they want, but no. Okay. The adults do not have to. Also, can the uh, base coaches at first and third wear a glove while coaching base runners at first and third? Um, you're going to have to help me on that. I don't think that's legal, is it? No, they should not have a, a glove. Uh, somebody writes, we ask all girls to have another girl go with them to the restroom because not all parents show up. Is that okay? Um, we've never done that before that I can recall. Usually it's a parent or maybe the coach's wife or even the tournament director, someone walking over. We haven't allowed multiple kids leave the dugout that I can recall. Okay. But that's up to, uh, I guess, maybe Ted should mention something on that. Uh, uh, I would say whatever the tournament director feels comfortable with. We've mentioned this last night to the uh, TOC baseball that when you're leaving the dugout needing to use the restroom, you want to make sure you let the umpires know because they want to make sure it's the same person coming and going. And I would highly recommend that the tournament director be told that somebody needs to be using the restroom. So 
they can be escorted to the restroom and back. Okay, great. Will a player be ejected if on their phone? Well, as I would assume, as you said, you're going to basically ask why they're on the phone and what's going on. And I mean, if a player has it, who's, who's ultimately responsible, the player or the manager? That would be my question, Jim. Uh, yeah, I think the, you know, the best way to handle this is just tell your players uh, if you have phones, you know, keep them in your equipment bag and do not bring them out. Yeah. Uh, will TOC play more than one tournament or is that it? TOC is a one tournament district, one uh, district tournament, and that will be it. Because as soon as TOC ends, all stars start within the next week. Okay. Uh, last year, blue ink was 50-50. If a parent uses black ink, and that would be for the medical release form. Well, here's the deal. The medical release form is not required for us. We just need the main form that's signed by the president, which he will sign in blue ink, I would assume. Um, well, we're not going to be monitoring the individual ones that I know of. That's correct. And I think it's more important that there is an actual medical release that uh, could be handed to um, uh, somebody if a player was injured. Yeah. Okay, that is all the questions. And we just have a few slides to end with. Right. So first of all, congratulations for making it to the Tournament of Champions. I mean, all the teams in there um, had successful seasons uh, in one way or another. And also congratulations to all those children and coaches that are involved in the All-Stars. Thanks for all the uh, hard work that you guys put into it. I know it's, you know, it goes on for not just year, but years because there's multiple years that some of you guys have been doing it. And um, it's, uh, it's a lot of time involved and uh, Little League is a great program that it is. Thanks for the sacrifices and all the time that you devote to our youth and uh, have a great tournament of champions and have a, uh, a great All-Stars. Um, have fun and, uh, you know, you as managers, you guys got a lot of eyes on you, a lot of young eyes. So remember, um, a lot of these kids look up to you so remember, you are setting an example for a lot of these kids out there. Um, so um, I want to say uh, I want to wish you luck and hope everything goes well. Ted, did you have anything you wanted to end on with the uh, with everyone here? Just want to thank everybody for their time this evening. I know that you probably had better things to do, like watching a basketball game. Uh, but I appreciate you spending the time here tonight. I wish you all of the best of luck. Uh, as I mentioned to the baseball managers last night, just remember it's a kid's game. Uh, nobody's showing up to watch you coach or manage. They're showing up to watch their kids play. And uh, you're there to facilitate the kids having a good time. So uh, beyond that, what it says at the bottom of the screen here was win with dignity, lose with class, and have a good tournament. Thanks, guys. I will all see you. If you're coming to Martinez, I will be there. Um, let me know, like I said, if you have any questions or any concerns, come find me. Or if you have my number, you can call me the night before if something comes up and you're a little concerned about it. Good luck to everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. Good job, Phil. Good job, Thanks. Jim. Good job, Jimmy. Thank you. Thanks, Jim, for everything. Absolutely. Some of those I thought you were better equipped to answer as far as from an umpire's point of view. Sure, no problem. So one more to go tomorrow night, huh? Yeah. Good job, Phil. Good job. The big one. Thank you.
Yeah, the All Star. There's gonna be a lot of people at that one. <laughs> baseball. 